Welcome to Dark Aspects, a video series inspired by the musings of Shigesato Itoi that digs into the plethora of family-friendly Nintendo games and related media to uncover any of the more adult story beats hidden within. I've nearly exhausted this goldmine of a trilogy, but another new diamond has been surfaced by fan translator Niesu Nekoban, who gifted the mother one and two novelizations to English speakers back in 2021. If you weren't a fan of some of the, uh, creative liberties writer Saori Kumi took with these beloved characters, you'll be happy to hear that another individual was responsible for this new book, Mother Invasion from the Unknown. So there is no connection to Kumi's novel. What's more, this thing isn't a novel, but a gamebook reminiscent of the interactive choose-your-own-adventure franchise with branching paths leading to multiple endings. Nintendo's no stranger to this genre, as they actually had their own adventure book series from the early 90s, similarly asking readers to make decisions on how to proceed, but also mortify librarians everywhere by requiring those readers to physically write in the book in order to keep track of items they collect and to solve puzzles. Mother Invasion from the Unknown is a more involved gamebook of this style, working brilliantly as a turn-based RPG converted from a digital experience into a tangible adventure. Playing this for the first time and having not experienced anything like it before, I was amazed at how all the mechanics were translated to a completely different medium. You can essentially do anything that's possible in the video game, from returning home to mom and eating your favorite meal, to grinding for experience and money to buy a better weapon. Besides some wild story differences I'll be exploring later, this feels like a successful port of the game to inferior hardware. That hardware in this case just happens to be good old pen and paper. Having an understanding of the original and how it plays does actually help you in some cases as well. To show what I mean, at one point you're given the option to speak with one of three people in the reindeer train station. After choosing the boy in the cap, the middle-aged man, or the old woman, you'll have to flip to the page where Doug has left the platform, so you can't talk to them all at once and it's kind of a pain to get back in there. If you're already familiar with Mother though, you'll know that the old woman is the one with an important item you'll need. The other two individuals are not particularly helpful, so you can save time by choosing Grand Grand. Do note that solutions won't always be one-to-one -one, though. Pippi, for example, who is actually the daughter of Podunk's mayor in this, not just some local girl he wants rescue to look good in time for his re-election, is found hiding in the casket closest to Doug at the bottom of the Podunk Cemetery's underground crypt, rather than the one that's furthest away. This gamebook is its own thing, too. Another separate spin on Itoi's original work. If you're wondering whether or not these different interpretations, Kumi's novel and Akio Higuchi's gamebook here, can be considered canon, I'd say definitely not, as they both contain material that directly contradicts the video game's plot. However, I think it's okay to headcanon certain supplemental depictions and backstories for these characters if you like them, especially to fill in minute details about NPCs who weren't given much screen time in the original. I like to look at these two retellings mainly as alternate universes, differing takes on the cast and settings of Itoi's world that provide new stories using the IP but aren't there to override or retcon his masterpiece. Pulling Invasion from the Unknown out from the darkness and viewing it in this light, we can experience the gamebook as the fun divergence it's supposed to be. If you're interested in what this wild ride has to offer and want all of its surprises intact, you're safe to watch until the time displayed on screen. I'll also remind you when the time comes. This video will be segmented into a couple of parts. The first is a brief explanation of how to play, and a look into the game's surprisingly gory introduction, while the second segment will be a spoiler-heavy analysis of the abundance of shocking themes found within. How to play Step 1 is to grab a pencil. Wait, scratch that. Step 1 is to give away any pencil eraser machines you may have lying around to your little sister to store for the time being. Then when it's safe, you can initiate step 2, which is to secure a pencil. Alternatively, you can save time and use a pen instead, which would remove the need for steps 1 and 2. I think we're off to a great start here. Okay, for real now, since a print version of this book is not available in English, you won't be able to write directly into it. And I don't think you'd want to tarnish it anyway, considering how much the Japanese version goes for online. To avoid confusion and buyer's remorse, you can use the free Google Doc on Niasu Nekoban's website. Links are in the description. This allows you to read the book digitally and print out the necessary pages to mark up willy-nilly as you play. That's economical and convenient. Dealing with printers is not, however. I wish mine were possessed by a poltergeist so I had an excuse to smash it. As a tip, I recommend downloading and printing each sheet individually rather than straight from the webpage to keep everything orderly and presentable. With a writing utensil in hand and a short stack of papers ready to go, let's dive into the game's systems. Page 1 features the level check and battle point chart. 
Rather than level ups being capped at a whopping 99, Invasion from the Unknown's highest level is a cool 5. Just like in the video game, your maximum number of psychic points and HP increases with each level, and you'll gain a new Psy ability or two you'll be able to use if you've got enough PP. The battle point chart below is here for non psi attacks to indicate if you've won or lost the particular enemy encounter. You actually fill this out before playing the game, and it's easy. There is a row of empty boxes underneath 10 letters, A through J. A number, 1 through 10, must be assigned to each letter. You just can't repeat numbers. In certain battle scenarios, the foe will have a set number, let's call it 4, to compete against your letter, let's say C. If the number you put beneath C is 5 or higher, you win the fight. If it's lower, you lose. In the event of a tie, you'll do another round with the following letter, that being D in this case. The exact repercussions of dying are left a little open to interpretation, so you're free to go back and try a lost battle again. And if, by chance, there is no way for you to come out on top in the skirmish, you may return to a save spot, the scenarios marked B, and re-roll your numbers, if you will. Nyasu, the translator, wanted to make it clear that the game can be a bit merciless, so it's up to you how seriously you play by these rules. There is a sort of trick we both discovered, where you are able to endlessly take the same path to repeat victorious battles an infinite number of times. The enemy's assigned number does not change, so you're always guaranteed to win. I see repeating this loop over and over to earn as many experience points as you'd like as the gamebook equivalent to level grinding near a spot that allows you to heal for free. It would be silly to physically flip through the necessary pages to traverse the same path four times, since all you'd be doing is wasting precious time, time that could be spent playing more gamebooks, so Niasu shortened the concept to multiplying EXP. That way, if you know for certain you found yourself a stable loop with the same end result, you can just pretend you went through the motions and give yourself four times the reward. How I approached this was successfully clearing a battle, then figuring out how to get back and fight it again. Once I knew I had a stable path to victory, I'd give myself the extra EXP and money without going too overboard. Think of it like the Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster's boost menu and its adjustable multipliers, or the easy ring hack for the game this very book is based on. Even with this quality of life measure, the quest can still be quite challenging, as brute force isn't always enough to ensure a win. There are some clear limitations in place for balance too, meaning you can't just go and give yourself 120 EXP from the get-go. You are initially capped at 50 experience points, which means you can't go higher than level 3 until you progress far enough in the story, making me think that the writer was aware of this so-called trick anyway. You can decide how you'd like to enjoy the game, but it's not as if a line hadn't already been drawn. Now that I've justified my own playstyle, I realize I've been talking for a while and have only covered this very first page. But the rest of the instructions are incredibly straightforward, so let's breeze right through them. This is a check chart for experience points and money earned from battles. The game makes it easy as 1 EXP equals $1, so if you earn 5 EXP from battle, that's 5 bucks in the bank. This is mother, so you'll need to ask your dad for money. And when you do, the total amount in this field must be crossed out and replaced with a zero. You'll then transfer the amount you had over to the money check chart box, aka Doug's on hand cash. You'll start the game with $20, so make sure to write that in here before you begin. The following boxes allow you to keep track of your current HP and Psy. Get drained of life or use up psychic energy in battle? These values will go down. Sleep at a hotel? The values will go back up, restored to the maximum amount allowed by your current level. The game will tell you precisely when to tick off the boxes in the Mark and Melody check chart, so don't fret about those. The next bit is where you're going to write in everything you've been given or have purchased throughout the journey. You can even sell certain equipment back to shops if you don't need it anymore. Like the rope, which you absolutely should not buy because it is one item in the game that is 100% useless. Seriously, it's a thing you can own to say that you own it and that's it. This leaves just one more segment of the progress tracker sheets, the step memo, which is by far the most convoluted thing on here, so here it goes. I'm just kidding. It's only here as a log of which pages you flip to so you can take a break and not come back hopelessly lost wondering where in Sam Hill this boy has been. You can think of it as a trail of breadcrumbs, but we're not here for bread, it's prime rib time baby. So let's get to the meaty content of this story. If you still want to avoid spoilers, don't jump ship yet. This is just the introduction. I promise I'll tell you when to quietly leave out the back. Anyway, I've been this long without mentioning our protagonist's full name. You may be amused to learn that it's not Ninten or even Ken this time, but Doug. 
Doug Holloway. If you're curious about the last names of his allies, they are Anna Bruton and Lloyd Schneider. Howdy. Teddy or Hurricane Joe does not oh. appear in this story, so sorry Teddy fans. I think he's cooler without a last name anyway. The prologue opens familiarly in the early 1900s with Doug's great-grandparents, George and Maria. Their tale is told through a series of newspaper excerpts. George Holloway and his wife Maria both went missing on the interstate highway when driving home to Podunk, which is apparently located in Maine, USA, from the town of Marysville. All that remained of the couple was the Ford Model T they had been driving, which was discovered at the foot of Mount Toy about 20 miles from town. With no other clue to the investigation, the search ceased exactly one month later when local police dismissed rumors that the mysterious black clouds that had covered Mount Toy were related to the incident, even though the clouds curiously vanished on the same day as George and Maria. Then, about two years after the search had officially been called off, George was miraculously discovered collapsed along the shore near another town in Maine, LA. That sounds wrong to say since LA's name comes from the city in California. Anyway, George was transferred to a hospital in Youngtown for treatment, but while he regained consciousness, he claimed to have no memory of the two years during which he went missing, and had stated to have no knowledge of the whereabouts of his wife Maria. The book then fast forwards 84 years, in 1988, to Doug's point of view. He's dragged out of dreamland not by his mother, but by the military helicopters that have occupied the skies for the last several days. We're told that Podunk is on lockdown by martial law because of murders, disappearances, and other strange things happening all over the place every day. Mr. Crockett, for example, is a local shoemaker who insists that he saw his nephew Harold wandering aimlessly while he was out fishing, staggering along the water's edge like a marionette with a broken string, staring blankly off into the distance. That's slightly concerning in and of itself, but made all the more disturbing when we learn that Harold's been deceased for a while now. He was hit and killed by an express train running along the nearby Paradise Line sometime last year. Mr. Crockett was not having a flashback or hallucinating either. He definitely saw his nephew out walking around as a member of the undead. Three days after the sighting, the vice principal of Podunk High School, Mitch Holland, was murdered right in the middle of the street by a creature with incredibly sharp claws. It tore the body to shreds and left what looks like wild animal hair scattered on the ground all around his corpse. If these horrific supernatural occurrences have one thing in common, it's that these strange black clouds that rolled over Mount Toy nearly a century ago have returned, which cannot be another coincidence. This fog is a bad omen, and whatever is causing it just may be responsible for all the paranormal phenomena plaguing poor Podunk, and unbeknownst to Doug, the greater world around his small hometown. Current newspapers have reported that scientists and a military research team went up to the mountain to investigate the clouds, but as you could probably guess, they never came back down. Half a year ago, Doug's own father went MIA when he was out at work, but all investigations have led to a dead end. So Doug's mom reluctantly gave up the search and threw away anything that belonged to her husband, out of sadness and no doubt anger at the situation. Doug hasn't yet given up on his old man though, and inadvertently finds a clue when he mischievously decides to explore the home's attic instead of finishing his homework. Eventually, a diary belonging to his great-grandfather with a cover reportedly as rough and rugged as a tombstone falls to his feet. Upon cracking open the bygone book, he learns that rather than a traditional diary, it's actually more like a letter. A letter written from George's deathbed addressed to his descendant in the distant future, because he had the power to foresee that at 12 years of age, his great-grandson Doug would be reading his dying words. George states that it is Doug's destiny to find and remember a certain special song, the key to saving planet Earth from calamity. Like himself, Doug has special abilities, in the boy's case telekinesis and telepathy, with an even greater power that lives dormant within him. George explains that Doug must channel these powers in order to fight his enemies, amusingly giving him the okay to use violence to solve his problems. George also mentions allies that will assist him along the way, including Doug's own father, Jack, who is aware of the situation and has gone into hiding to protect Doug, so he can only be reached via telephone. Doug will journey with two aforementioned friends, who are notably said to be children from other families in George's bloodline, and as such, have powers similar to, and perhaps even stronger than, Doug's. This means that by extension, Anna and Lloyd are related to Doug, so love triangles are off limits. And also, Lloyd has Psy in the story. Something of note to me is that Anna being likely more powerful than the main protagonist is a constant scene in the video game and the novelization, which continues on here. The diary then cuts off abruptly as the rest of the page has been torn off. Wiping away his tears, Doug then hears his mother screaming downstairs, and you should be able to guess what happens next. An electric lamp possessed by a poltergeist floating around the room attacks Doug, who explodes the rogue appliance into fine dust with his mind powers. 
That life-changing experience, paired with his ancestor's words, is enough for the plucky kid to get serious. So readying a backpack loaded up with a knife, sandwiches made by his mama, rain gear, extra pairs of underwear, $20, and an inhaler. You don't have to write down any of this like I did besides the $20, by the way. Doug sets out without much fuss from his mother, and where he immediately travels next is up to you. The first decision of this gamebook is to head north or south. It is here that I'm going to give you, my lovely viewers, a third option, as this is where you should stop the video and play the gamebook for yourself if you'd like to remain spoiler-free. I'm not going to summarize each and every detail of the plot, just the darker moments. And there's a lot of them if you couldn't tell by the prologue, but plenty will be discussed regardless so this is your final warning. For those of you still with me, where shall we head next? I say north, because that takes us directly to the charming little district literally named Skid Row for Doug's first confrontation with a feral man possessed by dark forces. You can rely on the default knife, which either does the job or gets Doug strangled, but not killed, he just loses two heart points. I mean health points. Wait, no, they're hit points here. I'm sorry, it gets confusing when the same initialism is used across the board for these types of games, albeit spelled out differently. Anyway, Doug kicks the fiend in the crotch and runs away to the heart of Podunk. The simplest way to handle this baddie is to purchase a bat and strike him in the head, forcing the creep to come to his senses for a respectable two experience points. You see, this is the first exploitable loop I was referring to and showed off earlier. If you have the bat, one can easily flip to scenario number 97 and head back to Skid Row to get in that same confrontation and smack him in the skull with no Hewlett Packards, HP lost, or psychic points spent. Alternatively, if you choose to fight with a knife and your number that correlates to C happens to be greater than 3, you can keep repeating this loop for a slightly higher 3 EXP, again with no repercussions. While you are technically able to lose all of your HP if you enter the brawl with a low amount for some reason and lose, you won't die in the sense that you can't resume play. Reaching 0 HP doesn't make for lost progress, it just locks you out of certain paths you could have taken otherwise. The only way to trigger a true game over is if the game explicitly tells you that your characters have died. When the game punishes you more than simply subtracting a few Hamtaro plushies from your total and allowing you to escape, it wants to make sure you suffer a swift and violent end. These game overs are so hilariously brutal I can't even believe some of them are in here. And there's over 40! I've been pretty eager to talk about them, so I'm just gonna rattle off a bunch in quick succession. Here we go! <clears throat> Doug can be run over by a truck, shanked by an old woman, mowed down by a polar bear, who's rumored to have already eaten another child alive, impaled by a starman's spear, crushed or squeezed to death by robots, sliced clean in half, roasted in the desert sun, gunned down by the guy who lends out his piloting services, yes, this one, petrified, engulfed in flames and reduced to ash, blown to bits after running over a landmine, torn to shreds by and turned into a zombie, overtaken by the alien leader Geeg's dark mind control and convinced to dash off of a cliff, charred by a violent lightning assault, devoured by an alligator, a gargoyle or a titany, take your pick, and finally the most surprising death of all, smashed into pieces by freaking Cthulhu. You know those curse words from the video game that can be given by scientists that have a funny effect in battle? Well, they make an appearance here. And in the game book, the curse words are revealed to be the infamous occult chant. Using the curse words in the lake at Mount Toy summons the Great Old One from his slumber, on call to mercilessly end Doug's quest. You'd think being led unexpectedly into any of these bad endings would be a bit grating, but the way these are written are so morbidly entertaining it kinda makes the rigmarole worth it. Take Doug's battle with the Little Saucer, for example. Quote, And this time, it hit me dead on. I didn't feel any pain or anything at all, really. Just my consciousness shattering into a million pieces. Unquote. That's amazing. I first read this line about a year ago, and I still think about it every now and again. What a vivid, profound description of being utterly vaporized. You can find yourself in some pretty vicious predicaments in the original game, but the text is, of course, nowhere near this graphic. While a mad gorilla beating up your party until everyone's unconscious is a thing that can happen, it'd be a stretch of the imagination to call it gruesome, because how exactly the kids are injured is not detailed. The guilty ape is just a static sprite in front of a black background after all. Just try to take 90% of these enemies seriously anyway, you can't do it, it's impossible. 
The game book being, well, a book without graphical and text limitations allows for manga-style pictures and descriptive paragraphs, which naturally ensures the same sort of fight is going to be much more explicit in print than its depiction in an 8-bit RPG. There is no fainting here either. Our heroes' bodies aren't rushed to a hospital and replaced with cute little ghosts until we've coughed up enough money to revive them. Doug and his friends unquestionably perish horribly via these bad endings, and often don't even have bodies left because they were obliterated. No crying until the end? Well, that's not too challenging, as there are 43 bad endings, so you won't have to hold back the waterworks for very long. Let's pretend we're good at this game, though, and get the ball rolling by rescuing the missing Pippi and buttering up the mayor so that Doug can pass through Podunk's barricade, guarded by several dozen uniformed policemen armed with shotguns, who aim their barrels at the boy before letting him through to the next town over, Marysville, which isn't under martial law. In Marysville, Doug comments on an overhead interstate highway sign leading to Jerusalem's Lot, a name taken directly from the short horror story by Stephen King. Fitting as it also takes place in Maine, like the majority of Stephen King's works. It's not the only reference though, as Higuchi mentions the famous writer in this book's afterword, and at one point in the story, prepare yourself for this, Lloyd is temporarily transformed into a Saint Bernard, a type of dog chosen perhaps because it's the same breed as Cujo, a playful pooch turned into a carnivorous canine when a rabid bat bites him. If this influence was intentional, I think as long as we keep Mr. Bat away from Lloyd, he should be fine. Now, I know I can't just casually mention Lloyd's unprecedented transfiguration and move on, so let's explore how the good boy turned into a good boy. The Onyx Hook In the video game, the Onyx Hook is a crucial item that can be used limitlessly to warp from anywhere in the real world to the fantastical realm of Magicant, a sugary pink dreamlike kingdom equated to being in a mother's womb that exists inside the mind of its queen, who wishes to hear every piece of the aforementioned song vital to saving the planet. In this gamebook, the device has the same powers of fast travel, but unlike the original, this onyx hook seems to require payment for passing between the two worlds, as when it's exposed to the light of the world above, it turns the person holding it into a dog. It is implied that one who's courageous enough can withstand the spell's effects, however, as Lloyd believes he allowed himself to become a dog, because he never wanted to get himself involved in fighting all of the awful monsters that constantly threaten the trio's lives. The first truly frightening ordeal with the evil creatures born from Geek's invasion is seen when Doug boards the train car leaving Snowman for the first time. The passengers initially seem ordinary, but when one of them turns towards Doug and reveals a disfigured face with chapped purple lips and a nearly toothless mouth, his heart sinks when he realizes a zombie somehow snuck itself in among the crowd. But that fear for them quickly turns into fear of them when he notices everyone else's faces have rotted away too. This train to Busan, I mean Spookan, is full of the living dead, and if you don't want Doug to join their ranks, there's only one way to survive. He must hurl himself through the window into a conveniently placed cabbage patch as the ghost train pulls into the station for the porter to deal with. If that wasn't traumatic enough, the first thing Doug witnesses when he enters the town of Spookan is the bone of an arm dangling from a truck's open window, belonging to a human skeleton. The streets are completely deserted, save for more walking corpses and pseudo-zombies who turn back to normal once defeated, so the only other individuals able to chat are this drunken man who warns about the local haunted manor, and a spiritual therapist who can restore Doug's senses if his heart begins to turn to stone in said haunted house. I think it's really cool that you may never have to visit the healer, if you can avoid the bionic bat's petrifying attack, but if you do make the wrong choices and are struck with this deadly affliction, the player is rewarded with extra lore, almost as if to make up for the inconvenience. Turning to stone allows the player to enter the healer's psychic clinic, Well, they'll be treated for free because the man divulges the fact that he's indebted to Doug's father. That's a detail you could miss completely, which reminds me of RPG characters that have easily missable dialogue only accessible when speaking with them at a particular moment in the game. The Mother series is all about these little bonuses rewarding curious players, and it's a big reason why I can't stop coming back to it. Another instance of an optional route that adds to the story is not having Anna's hat in your inventory as Doug heads into the church. Normally, the book describes Anna as being alone, with no one sitting at the large pipe organ inside. However, if you enter hatless, a priest occupies that spot softly playing hymns, and will ask Anna if anyone is there because he can't see for himself, revealing the man to be blind. It's not exactly necessary to know these things, but I think it's interesting that an unlucky player gets to objectively experience more content than someone who always comes out on top. Unless the former type of player gets frustrated and gives up trying to finish the game, that is. Speaking of Anna and the haunted house, she surprisingly provides the key because it's actually her old home. 
The girl has not been able to enter though, because it was owned by her parents and she's still too upset about their deaths to face it. Lonesomely journeying through the morbid mansion to learn a melody from the mad piano that plays itself is quite the challenge. As creatures of the night, like Shroudly the blood-spattered zombie, lunge at Doug with a taste for flesh. Melting the ghastly cretin with PK fire is notably the only way to get the dentures of all things in this game. And gifting these no doubt musty false teeth to a sexist old man is actually what leads you to Magicant for the first time. It's fascinating how certain side quests from the original change and become part of the main plot in this spin-off. In Mother, the old man is an eccentric guy, rumored to be older than 300 because of a special illness curing mouthwash he's concocted that's apparently the secret to living a long, long life. He only needs his dentures because he can't speak well without them, he mumbles if you don't try to communicate via telepathy, but in this book, the dentures are some sort of mystical tool he can use to speak of the other world instead. Once the party, which includes Lloyd the dog, gains access to the previously mentioned LA, Anna recalls visiting the town of Corruption and Chaos, aka Maine's personal garbage dump with her uncle a long time ago, but never again. What kind of town is it? Doug asks innocently. <sighs> the kind of town where there aren't many decent people. Anna replies with a sigh. She then proceeds to list off a number of hard drugs by name that can apparently be bought more easily than chewing gum. I was recently in LA to visit Super Nintendo World by the way, so I thought it'd be funny to go to a gas station and buy a pack of gum, so here's a picture of the receipt. I won't say or show what exactly Anna said in fear of breaking YouTube's guidelines, but if you'd like to know, then it's on page 69 of the document. Because of course it is. The kids and their loyal dog are made to fight a wonderfully silly off-model Starman soon after arriving, whose appearance is described as if it's an alien wearing a costume. Are these really supposed to be rectangular goggles? The face-off doesn't have to last very long though, as Doug can shoot it with a laser gun and dissolve the sad sap into an unrecognizable gooey mess. He then walks off the horror he just inflicted to throw shade at the South Bronx by comparing the disarray in LA to what he imagines it being like in that part of New York City, as he observes the vagrants and drug dealers that surround him. From the heart of town here, you have the difficult choice to visit the ocean, get mugged, or if you've already borrowed and destroyed the war veteran's tank back in the Yucca Desert, have him hunt the children down as he attempts to murder them with a handgun, rather than, I don't know, demand they pay for repairs. The crazy part is though, he actually keeps true to his threat in two of the bad endings. So you'd better hope you purchase tickets to the live house on a whim, because the kids have nowhere else to go, and the security guard is not letting anyone in regardless of who's chasing them. Even with the passes, however, they're not safe yet, as unfortunately for the bouncer, the old fogey ain't got tickets, but he's getting in anyway because he's not afraid to shoot the doorman, just doing his job in cold blood. The sound of the gunshot is drowned out by the music and mobs of people inside, so the children slip into the crowd to try and lose him. They manage to push themselves all the way to the front row, where the singer on stage demands that they step up into the spotlight to sing the blues. You can politely decline, but that ends with the heroes face down in a pool of blood because the gunman catches up with them. So with really no other choice, Doug and Anna grab a pair of microphones and let it out. The duo doesn't croon about how they used to think they were so smart or not being able to hide the holes in their hearts. They instead belt out about the crazy man in pursuit of them, who's now watching as an audience member below. Because he's gone insane, he actually decides he likes what he's hearing and begins whistling along. After the podunk blues outro, the man with a gun snaps out of his good mood and the kids hurry to the stage side exit. They are so close to being followed out the door. But luckily that same singer who brought the kids on stage puts his hand on their assailant's shoulder and says, you're not going anywhere friend until you sing us some blues. And that's the last time you'll hear from him. Moving forward, you are no longer able to return to this part of town, not that you'd want to anyway. Now that I think about it, the kids should have just used the onyx hook to warp back to Magicant when they were trying to lose him. Speaking of getting lost though, I think now is a perfect time for a story that's relevant, I promise. In 2022, my wife and I were staying in an Arizona city about four hours from where we live for a mini vacation. We went out one night to check out a cool lava river cave we had heard about, so we filled our backpacks with flashlights, water, and a few snacks expecting we'd be in and out in about an hour. I didn't want to explore much longer than that because we had just booked a haunted history tour scheduled for 9 o'clock. We were fully aware that there'd be no cell service underground, and we considered the possibility of getting lost, but figured as long as we'd start heading back at around 8 we'd be fine. Well, we entered the tunnel at around 7.30 and did not find our way back out for another two hours. We thought we were keeping track of where we were going, but the twisty lava tube was filled with numerous branching paths and it all sort of blended together. 
There was nothing to easily differentiate one area from the next, besides some low ceilings you had to basically crawl through, and some occasional graffiti like bouillon soup and hot dog, but they were few and far between. My unreliable sense of direction didn't help us escape. So we wound up running in circles. I'm not gonna lie, it was kinda scary being disoriented in the cold dark, looping around a labyrinth in different configurations like it was some kind of special hell we were trapped in. I wanted to talk about this less than stellar experience, because this gamebook's interpretation of the Crystal Cavern and Magic Camp reminded me a lot of our unanticipated little maze run. Finding your way to the other side of this dungeon is incredibly confusing at first, because you'll start off with two choices, east or west. Depending on that choice, you'll arrive at either a fork in the path or a four-way crossroads, which continues on until you arrive at a dead end, a point of interest, or the exit. I do like that options are marked with an X once you finish them, so the correct path leading out of Magicant is clear on subsequent trips, like memorizing the route back home in the original, but that initial trek through the tunnels brought the fear right back to me. At least in the lava tunnel I explored, there was no dragon waiting to roast me at the end of a wrong turn, just a wife with a dragon tattoo to give me an icy gaze. Speaking of the dragon, this goofy guy in the video game is just kinda there because Dragon Quest did it. It's a boss that holds the sixth melody, and it looks hilarious, and that's about it. It poses an awesome challenge, but in the game book, a test of physical strength this fight is not. As much like Geeg, all psi attacks against it are useless. Just before the dragon prepares to breathe its last breath of fire and deliver the killing blow, Anna reaches out to the dragon with her mind and learns that it isn't evil or acting as a puppet for malevolent forces. This creature is acting out because its young was killed by a being from the stars, and is stuck dreaming about a time when its child was still alive. That's a terribly tragic backstory to include for this character that didn't originally have one, a theme that presents itself a few times in the story and will again before the true ending is reached. Even though the gang didn't really solve its troubles, they just listened to it sing a sorrowful melody, kissed it on the forehead, and lulled it back to sleep. It's time to find a way to transform Lloyd back into a human. And who's better for the job than Doug's father? Jack finally comes out of hiding to rescue the kids on Mount Toy from the killer R7038 robot, and reveals that he has psi abilities of his own to see into the future, like George, and use PK healing. He informs Doug that he and his friends must journey to the nearby mountain lake, and gives a hint on how to defeat Guy by warning everyone to conserve as much psi as they're able to. You can see a full front-facing profile of Doug's papa in this image, but unfortunately he's faceless, so Kenji Masuda, the illustrator, opted to keep his appearance a mystery. That or the man's face was taken by Ko the face dealer or the Dark Lord from Utopia. He could even secretly be Indiana Joe from the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. Type your theories in the comments, I'd love to read them. Since Doug's father arrived in an SUV and not a tank though, he didn't actually have the means to take care of a giant robot, so it reappears as soon as he waves goodbye. You can go against Jack's advice by attempting to fight it again with Psy, but that just wastes it completely and severely injures Lloyd, so I don't recommend rebelling against the man in this case. Regardless of his physical condition, however, the dog who's become a real boy will freeze up when they reach the lake in fear of their impending doom. The kids thankfully discover a motorboat at the water's edge, so they hop in and try to start it, but the engine's wires have been cut, and the only one there who's capable of fixing it is Lloyd, who's currently as stiff as a board. This next part is pretty funny. There are two paths here, one leading to safety, and the other to the robot seizing them all. You have no choice in the matter. The correct option must be taken if you have enough experience points. So how does Doug use this abundance of EXP he's accumulated to survive the life or death situation? He takes a deep breath to clear his mind and channels all of his energy into the palm of his hand, which is then used to slap Lloyd across the face as hard as he can so that his friend comes back to reality and repairs the vehicle so they can all make a break for it. The boat takes them out to the middle of the lake, but then sputters out of commission, where a telepathic voice asks for a specific item, the can of words. This is an example of the game being ruthless if you aren't well enough prepared. Using the curse words, of course, causes the cosmic horror to obliterate everyone, but not owning any at all results in a less interesting demise at the hands of the colossal automaton who had ample time to meet you at the busted boat. The words of love are required to access the laboratory, calling forth a giant whirlpool that drags everyone down to the bottom of the mirror. In the original, the place they wake up in is referred to as the Unknown Lab, but George has been here as he's the one who constructed Eve so that the heroes may match the might of the enemy robots. In the novel, this lab belonged to Lloyd's father, Dr. Distorto, who is a generic enemy type in the video game. Here though, it's revealed that the strawberry tofu-loving scientist who traded Doug the can of words for his favorite snack is in charge of this underwater base. He's the director at the Instant Voice Lab we visited earlier, but also a doctor of engineering at this power robotics laboratory. 
For the last 20 years, the doctor's been ordered by the United States Army to work with Eve, a robot recovered from a crashed UFO programmed to fight for Doug. And fight for Doug she does. But sadly, for even less time than you'd expect, as the ever-incessant R7038 must be dealt with right away. While Eve is very powerful, she can't overtake the threat without a self-destructive sacrifice, which is a canon event in the Motherverse, as it happens in all three of these stories. So, with tears in his eyes, Doug gives the command and the two mechs explode into scrap metal. Eve then plays the final melody for the children, which ultimately has the effect of restoring Queen Mary's lost spirit. The Queen then reveals herself in person and explains that she's not actually a human being, but an alien who had left her home planet for Earth, where she went by the name Maria. It is here she fell in love with and married a man named George. Together, they had three children. Her body, however, was never suited for life on this planet, so she and her husband were made to leave what she calls their real children behind to return to her home planet, where they eventually conceived a fourth child, Geeg. This means that yes, Geeg is biologically related to Doug, Anna, and Lloyd too. George had a premonition that their newly born son would someday unleash an evil energy onto Earth and take it for himself. The only silver lining in this is that he knew the descendants of his other three children would have the power to stop him. George decided to travel back to Earth in the final years of his life, and began laying down the pieces of a plan that would help these descendants defeat Geeg when the time came, like hiding the melodies of that special lullaby Maria used to sing to Geeg. After the Cosmic Destroyer had left for Earth, Maria followed after him in her own ship when the mother met with an unfortunate accident and was forced to create the subspace of Magicant to keep herself safe albeit causing her memories to be lost in the process. Now hearing the completed lullaby once more in the current time, her spirit is able to become whole again, and so Magicant disappears while her soul joins George's in the afterlife. The purpose of their quest and what exactly they've been gathering has been made crystal clear, but there's still the problem of how to reach Geeg. Wait, never mind, that solves itself when the black clouds of Mount Toy begin to part and Geeg descends in his mothership to reach them first. He cannot stand to be related by blood to such inferior creatures he sees as playthings, and so he's decreed they must perish before him. Geeg attacks with shockwaves of wicked telepathy that brings the trio to their knees, sending dark thoughts to sear painfully through their brains. Doug notably cries out, Please, give us strength, in desperation, which is a nice parallel to Paula's prayers when fighting Gigas at the end of Mother 2. Geeg's power to send out overwhelming, intrusive thoughts affects each child differently, targeting the guiltiest moments of their lives. For Anna, we're given a glimpse into her tragic backstory, detailing a car crash she lost both of her parents to. Anna was asleep in the back seat of the car, and had a dream she was playing a game with her father that involved covering his eyes and making him guess who's behind him. She was just playing with him in the dream, but because of her psychic powers, she inadvertently blinded him for real while he was driving, and it caused him to wreck the car. It's not her fault, well I guess technically it is, but she couldn't know or control what was happening, so on top of the general devastation of losing her parents, she also blames herself for their deaths. I wonder if having blinded her father was the reason she assisted the blind priest at her church too. For Doug, we learn that when he was just 8 years old, he had pushed his little sister Mimi down the stairs, which broke one of her legs. Geeg leans into the motivation Doug initially had to push his kid sister in the first place, and tries to convince the boy that he did it because he wanted to kill her. That's right, you try to kill your sister. You try to kill her, you want her dead. Lloyd's dark thoughts here are comparatively pretty tame, but the poor kid has been bullied all of his life, so Geeg just prepares a depressing montage of his classmates and parents calling him a coward. Geeg also forces images of, quote, horrible, nightmarish things, like scenes straight from hell itself, things no human should ever see, unquote, into their minds as they try to sing the song. But if your HP is high enough to endure his wrath, he eventually won't be able to listen to the song any longer, likely due to the pain of losing his own mother, stirring conflicting feelings about humanity, and retreat back into the stars from whence he came. With Earth saved from the invasion, we're treated to a brief epilogue, which, hey, is more than Famicom players got, as the first version of Mother ends bluntly with Geek's surrender. In this epilogue, Doug throws away his inhaler, because I guess he can just decide not to have asthma anymore. I wish I could decide not to have OCD anymore. He then likens what the three of them learned from their arduous journey to the Wizard of Oz. Doug would be the Scarecrow, Anna the Tin Man, and Lloyd the Cowardly Lion. He then ponders who the Dorothy of the party would be, and the last line of the book reads, well, I guess that would be you, the one reading this book right now. That's what I'm talking about. I wish more endings would make me feel like I'm Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. There's no questionable themes of pregnancy to be found here like in the novel either, so that's a plus. There is a little bit more from the author in the afterword to read, which is neat because he describes Mystery Toy as being similar to the father in My Neighbor Totoro, Tatsuo Kusakabe, a character he actually voices. 
Like with Saori Kumi's novel, Akio Higuchi writes that Itoi gave him permission to arrange the story however he liked, so it wound up being a version of Mother that is very close to an original story. Having finished two of these original stories based on Mother, in addition to the real thing, I feel like I've leveled up as a fan, and you should too now that you've taken this journey with me. I'm very glad these alternate stories exist. Mother is the shortest of the trilogy, and I've beaten it twice now, but even still, it's easily the one I've invested the least amount of time into. So having external materials set in this world with these characters is exciting because it means I get to spend more time thinking about them, enriching my relationship with the original. From the lore-filled Mother Encyclopedia, to the official lyrics from songs in the Mother original soundtrack, there is no shortage of supplemental content to engage with and enhance a video game already filled to the brim with heart and ambition. The Mother series has not lost its luster to me over the years. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Despite how much I've read, written about, and have replayed these games over and over again, I find myself appreciating this trilogy a little bit more with every year that passes. Yeah, the most recent game in the series was released all the way back in 2006, but this fanbase will never let their fire burn out, as the core games are just that interesting. New material is constantly being produced or uncovered by talented fans too, whether it relates directly to Itoi's masterpieces or was inspired by them. This will be the last Dark Aspects of Mother episode until Earthbound 64 is found and dumped online, or something else substantial comes along. So I wanted to take a moment to express my gratitude for those of you who have been watching these videos over the years. With this milestone finished, I'm going to combine this and every other episode that follows my original 3 hour retrospective of the video games into a sequel video. It'll be an updated compilation including my analysis of the Mother novels, the book trilogy that inspired Mother 3, and everything we currently know about Mother 64. You can expect that to drop on my channel sometime soon. As for brand new Mother content, don't worry, I haven't run out of things to talk about, so you can expect more videos about my favorite series in the near and distant future. A big thank you to my patrons, Brian and Susan, Jennifer, Kathleen, Dat Barry, Tori, Captain Harlock, Janssen, and Nene. I also wanted to thank Clyde Mandolin, Kenny Sue, Niasu, Starman.net, and the Mother Forever team for even making these videos possible. And last but not least, I appreciate all of you who watched this video through to its end. Let it be known that you too are Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz.